And in the background, you'll see a clump of trees that were growing in what was once the deepest part of the wetland area. The main way wetlands have been drained for hundreds of years is by digging ditches. These individuals are hand digging a drainage ditch and they're digging it for a project called the Missouri Farms Project in the year of 1938. Digging a ditch is hard work. I'm sure some of you have dug ditches. It's not something that anyone wants to do unless you have to. And people dig di ditches because they're very effective at changing wetland to farmland. The most obvious sign that any wetland has been drained is the presence of a ditch. This simple drawing, it shows a profile view of a wetland, a typical wetland. And what I'd like you to note is that water is standing in a shallow basin and the lower edge of that basin is bordered by a higher ground and we call this a natural dam or a rim. And the slopes in this drawing are much steeper than what you would find the slopes of a natural wetland basin. And I made them steeper so you could see how this dam functions to maintain water in the wetland. Now, a wetland is drained by digging a ditch and the ditch um, will carry water downhill, but because natural wetlands have this rim around the lower edge, you need to cut through that with the ditch. And the ditches can be left open or it can be filled with soil if a drainage structure is buried in the ground in the bottom of the ditch. Now, here you see three wetlands on a hillside. And wherever you go in North America, the ground is sloped and the wetlands occur on these slopes and they're natural basins along the length of the slope. And if you wanted to drain these wetlands, what you would need to do is to dig a ditch that was deeper than any of the wetland basins along that hillside. So here you see all three of these wetlands were drained by digging one long ditch and the ditch was dug deeper than the bottom of the basin and it went through the rim of each one of these natural wetlands and it was able to drain multiple wetlands on the landscape. And that ditch would end up in an outlet which could be a move stream or it could be even a deeper ditch so that you could move that water downhill. Now this is an interesting photo here. It shows Fort Necessity and uh, this fort was built by George Washington in the state of Pennsylvania in May of 1754. Now George Washington chose the site because it was open and provided good visibility. This inexperienced British officer attempted to defend the fort against French soldiers, but eventually he had to surrender. And what I'd like you to note in this artist's drawings is that the um, fort is surrounded by wetland, and this is uh, why it wasn't growing trees because the soils were saturated and the trees weren't able to survive. Now, Fort Necessity was later made into a national park and a, rep a, re a replica of Fort Necessity, you can see it in the background. The land surrounding Fort Necessity is now basically wet metal wetland. It's dominated by cattails and sedges maybe a little bit of goldenrod in the foreground. And if you walk around Fort Necessity, you'll find that an original stream channel of Great Meadow Creek is still present. And this is the original stream channel, much as how it appeared in the year 1754. Now, if you'll note that the stream is wide and it's dominated by sedges and rushes, and there's really no defined stream channel with better banks. The stream is really a wetland and the wetland is really a stream. And the flow of water at Great Meadow Creek, it was later diverted into a ditch so the area could be farmed. The red arrow shows the center of the ditch that was used to move Great Meadow Creek in the year 1854. The dark green strip on either side of the red arrow uh, are alder trees and they're growing along the banks of the ditch and the restored Fort Necessity is in the background. Now this moved and channeled Great Meadow Creek has a deep and a wide channel 
with vertical banks, unlike the natural stream. The ditch doesn't look like a ditch where the park employee is standing because um, it is quite narrow and it's grown up to these alders. Now, Mr. Fazenbacker was the landowner at the time in 1800s who dug the ditch so that the area could be farmed. Now here is a natural tributary to Great Meadow Creek at Fort Necessity. And again, you'll notice that there's no defined stream channel and banks. And it looks much like a wetland, but really it's a stream. Now the average width of the stream channel is about 10 meters and the average bank height is only about 15 centimeters. The stream, it follows a sinuous path and appears much like a long and narrow wetland. If you'll note that the stream doesn't contain open water, no bed and banks to the stream. And this is really how the majority of natural streams appeared before they were ditched and drained to create farmland. The red arrow shows the location of a ditch that was used to move a tributary of Great Meadow Creek. And the open water in the stream channel is maintained because of high shear stress. And if you'll notice that there's really very few, if any, sedges or bulrushes growing on either side of the ditch. This is because the ditch has done its job and has drained the surrounding land for farming. The red arrow shows the location of another ditch that was dug by Mr. Fazenbaker. And this ditch was dug along the base of a hill and it was dug to drain the wet meadow wetland to create a large field for farming. In the presence of open water, vertical banks, and a straight Eight line shape shows you that it's a ditch and not a natural wetland or stream. Does this look like a ditch? It is. It's a ditch that was dug through a wet meadow and a beaver pond in the state of Nevada. Notice that the ditch is straight, or I should say the stream channel is straight, nearly vertical banks, and it's eroding. And water flowing the ditch is primarily groundwater that's being pulled and drained from the surrounding historic wetland. And the plants growing on either side are not sedges or rushes, but rather rabbit brush and sagebrush and some of the dryland grasses because the ditch has done its job and drained the wetland area. Okay, we're gonna go back to Fort Necessity. The red arrow here shows a ditch that was dug to drain the wetlands for farming. And in the bottom of this ditch, the owners placed clay drain tiles so they could further drain the area for farming. Well, the National Park Service came in and broke the drain tiles. They didn't remove them. But this explains why sedges and rushes are now growing. By breaking the drain tiles, they didn't disable them. And the wetland is still being drained, but drained partially. And it's still moist enough where some sedges and rushes can grow. Now in the background, we see Fort Necessity, and you can see it was built in a wet meadow wetland. You see the sedges and rushes that are growing in saturated soil. But you know, the land surrounding the fort itself is really quite dry. And it's quite dry because the National Park Service drained it so that people wouldn't get muddy feet when they visited this replica of the stockade. So the soldiers under George Washington's command hid behind these berms of soil they formed by digging trenches. And they hid behind the berms so they wouldn't get shot by the British. Now this area was a muddy mess during the battle and there was water standing in the trenches. So beginning in 1932, the wetland around the fort was drained and filled so visitors didn't have to walk through the mud. And the Civilian Conservation Corps assisted with the drainage between the years 1935 and 1938. What can see drain from the base of the restored fort. And these drains carry water into a subsurface system of buried drain tiles made out of clay. And these drains were not installed by George Washington, but they were installed by the Park Service. And if you walk around Fort Necessity, you see it's no longer a wetland. The drainage structures and the ditches are pulling water from the site. We've all heard that wetlands were drained for farming, but you know, it's really difficult to find a photograph of a wetland before it was drained. And in this photo, you'll see a wetland before it was drained. I was able to come across 100 photographs that were taken 
employees of the Soil Conservation Service. And they were photographs taken of farms before they were drained in the state of Vermont and in New York. These photos were taken in the 1950s and 60s. Almost every photo shows a wetland before it was drained and describes the wetland drainage projects. And now this photo shows the Germain Alloyne Farm in Canaan, Essex County, Vermont. The photo was taken in 1958. The caption on the photo says, area to be drained. Now in this photo, okay, let's see here. This photo shows another wetland ready to be drained on the Boulogne farm in Canaan, Vermont in May 1958. The caption states, mostly the complete area to be drained. And if you look closely, you'll see a flock of ducks that are rising off of this wetland before it was drained. Now in this photo, um, the Soil Conservation Service engineers are using an optical level and a rod to identify the natural rim maintaining water in this wetland. They did a survey to see how deep the ditch needed to be dug and how long the ditch needed to be dug to cut through the rim of the natural wetland. They often placed clay tiles in these ditches and covered them with soil to drain the wetland. And the caption in this photo states, Elberg, Vermont, Grand Isle County, April 1962, location of outlet into swamp above Northwest Over Farm on Harley Hutchins Farm, where 100 acres of drained land water will be emptied. This will be carried over lands below the group ditch, looking east or downstream. Here an SCS engineer is using an optical level and a rod to measure the elevation needed to cut through the rim and make an outlet to drain this wetland. And the photo was taken in April 1962. They dug a ditch that cut through the rim of the wetland. They drained the wetland for farming. And the area is no longer wetland anymore. Here's a deep ditch that's being dug to drain a wetland. And if you look here, you can see sedges and cattails that are dominating the wetland vegetation. The photo is labeled Hubbard, Hubbard Farm, Salisbury, Vermont, Otter Creek Soil and Water Conservation District, July 1957. Excavation of the drainage ditch was done with a half yard backhoe. The ditch is roughly four and a half feet at this point, and it was flooded from high water in Otter Creek, from which it will carry the water in the outlet. And the ditch continued for thousands of feet through the muck soils of the wetland. Now this photo was taken in June 23rd, 1959, and it shows the construction of an open drainage ditch in Fairfax, Vermont. And here are some observations that I've made by looking at the photo. The farm is being managed for hay. You can see the hay bales. The ditch is being dug in an existing wetland that's growing cattails and bulrushes. The ditch is being dug with nearly vertical banks. The valley appears to be both a wetland and a stream at the same time. And the perimeter of the drainage project was marked using wooden stakes that also show elevations being followed to dig the ditch so it will carry water downhill and not cause erosion, but yet drain the wetland. Here we have a photo and it shows the open end of the drainage project on the Sheds Farm in Fairfax, Vermont. And here are a few observations about this photo. Notice that the wetland carries, has open pools of water, also has rocks and logs in the wetland. And the wetland is really a wide, sinuous stream. Here a backhoe has been used to dig a ditch on the Harold Davis farm in Vermont in 1966. Clay tiles are going to be placed in the ditch and then covered with soil. And the caption on the photo states that the center of the tile line will follow the wood stakes that pass through the area of open water. This project was designed and supervised by the government, the Soil Conservation District. These, both of these photos were taken in November, 1956. They show a large wetland on the Palmervilles farm near Pittsville, Vermont. And the Soil Conservation District was planning to drain these wetlands. 
And if you look on the right, that wetland has muskrat houses, muskrat houses in the middle of it. And notice how the muskrats are keeping the cattails from dominating the wetland. And here's a ditch that's being dug this wetland on the pigeon property near Otter Creek in Vermont, 1957. The caption states, the soil is muck subject to flooding from Otter Creek every year or more often. Note that there's a covered bridge in the background. And a couple more photos. Um, here's a ditch, we call this a diversion ditch, and it was dug along the base of the hill on the Gilbert Farm in Vermont. And this ditch was dug to intercept and carry water before it reaches the wetland. The wetland was on the more level ground and the hillside was the runoff of what was supplying the wetland with water. And the ditch collected and diverted this water away from the wetland. And this is how the water from springs is diverted. And there was no date on this photo. Maybe you've heard of the practice of using lands to farm wetlands lands or bedding. And what we're looking at here is a drainage system called lands, and it's on a farm in Plattsville, New York. The photo was taken in 1958. And this bedding system, which is also called lands, involves shaping the land into a series of parallel ridges so that the ridges can be farmed. And where they take the soil to make the ridges, they make a shallow ditch that doesn't drain, and we call this a dead furrow. And the dead furrows are visible as these dark parallel lines, and the individual is standing in one of the dead furrows. If you see the pattern of these parallel ridges on the land, you are looking at a farmed wetland, and it's being farmed in lands. The land system of farming is visible on these aerial photos, and these aerial photos are of an area of New York, and the red arrows point to the wetlands that are being farmed in lands. Well, we're on Salt Spring Island, BC. This uh, photo shows a wetland that we're planning to build. The pink flags mark the perimeter of the wetland. We didn't know that this area used to be wetland until we started building the wetland. And as we were building the wetland, we uncovered a fully functioning rock drain. The rock drain measured approximately 18 by 18 inches and it was buried 12 inches below the surface. And look at the amount of water that this rock drain will carry. We're not sure when this rock drain was installed. It could have been in the early 1900s. It was still functioning perfectly well. Now, the rock drain appeared to start at the clump of trees in the background near the center of the field and the trees are growing in what we think used to be the deepest part of the wetland. There were some clues that there were rock drains in the field. When you walk around the field, you find these vertical holes in the ground that were not dug by animals. And the holes were located over the rock drains and they were probably formed because water from the surface made its way directly into the rock drain and scoured a hole or a whirlpool. So I have found that rock drains were used commonly to drain wetlands throughout BC, Canada, and the United States, and that they can function for hundreds of years. These people are in, on the Finger Lakes National Forest in New York, and the red arrow marks the location of a rock drain that we uncovered while constructing a wetland. And the outlet for the rock drain was the deep ditch along the edge of the road. Now, rock drains were generally made from the rock that was picked from the fields. And it's a good way to recycle, pick the rocks out of the fields and make the rock drain with the rocks. And uh, here's Robin Anchild, and uh, she is investigating a rock drain that we found on a wetland restoration project. They use smaller diameter rock here, and in order to build a successful wetland, one needs to look for these buried drainage structures and remove them. Yosemite National Park in California is probably the last place you'd expect to find drained wetlands. This photo shows a meadow at Royal and Yosemite National Park. 
The meadow used to be wetland. Ditches and buried clay drain tiles were used to drain this wetland and others in Yosemite. The wetlands at Royal Arches, they're drained so the fields could be maintained as pasture and cut for hay because there used to be many horses that were used in the park. And these old fields are now growing velvet grass, thistle, and mullein. And if you look closely at the lower edge of some of these fields in Yosemite, you'll find outlets to the buried clay drainage structures that were used to dry these wetlands. Now here's an engineering plan that we found. It's dated February 4th, 1935. Shows the installation of four and six inch diameter clay tiles that were used to drain a small pond and a swampy meadow at Royal Arches in Yosemite. Plans like this, they show the installation of the buried drainage structures. You rarely find them because more often the farmer hand drew the drainage system on a piece of paper, installed the drainage system, and then the paper was lost. The red arrow shows the location of a ditch that was dug to drain a natural wetland at the Yellow Pine area in Yosemite National Park. Now, most ditches that are dug to drain wetlands are shallow ditches. They're not the deep scars on the line and land, and most people overlook these shallow ditches. They don't think they cause any harm, but really they're the ones responsible for removing water from the wetlands. Now here's a fisheries biologist, Rob Grasso. He's standing in a head cut that formed in a drainage ditch used to drain a wetland in Yosemite National Park at the Yellow Pine area. The head cut now threatens to further drain the wetland by causing a deepening and widening of the ditch. And signs of wetland are really, signs of wetland drainage are really common wherever you go in Canada and in the United States. Ditches are dug to drain wetlands and they're often missed when you look at LIDAR images. Robin is standing in the middle of a drainage ditch, a diversion ditch, used to drain a wetland. The ditch was dug along the base of the hill. Uh, the tall vegetation that's growing in and near the ditch, uh, this intercepts the laser beams and masks the presence of ditch on laser images. I have seen where hundreds of thousands of dollars have been spent obtaining laser images, and you still can't see the ditches because of the tall reed canary grass that obscures the ditches. Here's an aerial photo showing our farm in Eastern Kentucky. And when you look at the aerial photo closely, you probably won't see any signs of wetland drainage. It's really hard to see that wetlands have been drained. Uh, here's the farm that we built and you can see that we're surrounded by hilly ground and low mountains. And most people would say that wetlands never occurred on this landscape, it's too hilly. Well, this map shows the drainage features that I found in our farm after living here for 24 years. Most of these features are not visible in aerial photographs, but were identified by walking and digging in the ground. The barn we built was built on a filled wetland. I discovered this when digging holes to replace posts in the barn. The hydric mineral soil in the wetland had been buried to create a level area for building the barn. And each time I dug a post hole, water came into the hole and the soils were hydric down deep, showing us it was a filled wetland. The red line shows a ditch that I maintain around our barn. And this ditch prevents the barn from flooding when there's a storm. And this ditch is what would have been a natural stream that would have filled the natural wetland where the barn was built. The ditch flows after heavy rains and I must keep it cleaned of leaves because the leaves will block the ditch and flood the barn. So ditches require regular maintenance or they'll become partially plugged and your field will flood. The shaded area in our field used to be wetland, and this wetland was drained years ago by channeling the stream and by installing wood drains in the ground and plastic drain, uh, 
clay drain tiles and plastic pipes. And the ditch was dug to move the stream and the current stream is the red arrow. The natural stream really didn't have a better banks and it was probably a series of beaver ponds and wet meadows. Now that red line is a ditch and it borders with the neighbor's property. And unfortunately my neighbor won't consider restoring the stream. So when we were uh, working on our farm, um, we were installing a new buried drain line to keep one of the pasture fields dry. And we came across a wood drain that had been built many years ago. And here are some of the logs that came out of the wood drain. And the wood drain was still functioning. Now in BC, I find many wood drains that are made from the logs of Western red cedar. And they're functioning after a hundred years of being buried in the ground. So we added a six inch diameter plastic slotted drain line to uh, supplement the wooden drain drainage structure. And I had to place the straw mat on the surface to control erosion because when there was a strong rain with runoff, it would overwhelm the drainage system and cause erosion. So the area you're looking at was likely wet meadow and beaver ponds. And here it is a year later. Doesn't look like wetland anymore, does it? Uh, the shallow depressions, the scattered sedges, and if you were lucky enough to see the buried drain line, these would be signs that the area used to be wetland. Now here's a field and we're tying pink ribbons around it to show where we wanna build a wetland. And this wetland was drained by uh, a ditch and you can see the red arrow, it uh, points out the ditch. And they also installed clay tiles in the ground to drain the wetland. And we're on the Finger Lakes National Forest in New York. Now, in restoring this wetland, I wanted to fill in the ditch and disable it, but the US Forest Service would not allow me to touch the ditch. They said they wouldn't let me touch the ditch because it had wetland characteristics. And I have found this throughout North America that some professionals will say, don't touch the ditch because it's a natural stream with wetland characteristics. Unfortunately, uh, what they're doing is protecting uh, the drained wetland. And when we were working on that wetland, restoring it on the Finger Lakes National Forest, we found four inch diameter clay tiles that were buried in the ground uh, to drain the wetland. And these clay tiles were functioning, you can tell, because they're not filled with soil. Uh, the students that were helping with the project were thrilled when we found these buried drain tiles. One of them took a number home, they made a wine rack out of the drain tiles. So you can expect to find clay tiles almost uh, with almost every wetland project you work on in North America. And unless you remove these clay tiles, your wetland is not going to hold water. People underestimate how effective these clay tiles and plastic drain lines are in draining the wetland. Uh, here we are looking at a tile outlet after a heavy rain. This is a four inch drain tile line and you can see that the water is just pouring out of that outlet to drain the wetland area for farming. The outlets of buried drainage systems are exceedingly difficult to find. There are no shortcuts to use in finding these. If you're looking for the outlets of clay drain tiles, plastic drain pipes, rock or wooden drainage structures, it's gonna be almost impossible to find the outlets. And these buried drainage structures are not visible on aerial photographs. They're not visible on LIDAR images. One should assume that they're present on your wetland project, dig and find them during construction. Do you think there were aliens in this photo? This photo shows Allen Lake, a drained wetland on the Coconino National Forest in Arizona. Now in the 1980s, there was an attempt to improve Allen Lake for ducks. The Arizona Game and Fish Department used dynamite and dynamite and earth moving equipment to dig out portions of Allen Lake. And they dug it out in this wagon wheel pattern. And their hope was if they dug out portions, they would create deeper water that would benefit waterfall. But unfortunately, when they dug these ditches and the wagon wheel pattern, they broke through a compacted clay layer 
and they got into a uncompacted clay layer and they got into areas that were high in sand and they ended up draining the entire natural lake. And what they did is they dug a pond and you can see it on the upper right edge of the wagon wheel. They dug this pond and they made all their deep ditches drain into it. So basically what they did is that they made a sump that had a permeable base and they ended up completely draining natural Allen Lake. So the main reason Allen Lake wasn't holding water is that water was soaking into the ground in the bottom of this constructed pond that was dug in the natural wetland. The constructed pond had a permeable base and what was happening is that water was being injected into the ground and that pond was much like the hole in the bottom of a flower pot and it would bring that water into the sand and gravel layer. So the way you repair a wetland that's been drained this way is that one needs to take that clay that is present, line areas that are permeable with a layer at least 70 centimeters thick and compact it. Now here's Duck Lake. This is a natural 75 acre isolated ephemeral wetland on the Kayaban National Forest in Arizona. The lake had a history of providing habitat to waterfowl and to amphibians. And in, they had species like the Virginia rail, Sora, least bittern, and great blue heron. But years ago, a deep water pond was dug in Duck Lake. And this penetrated a permeable layer. And the deep pond is now draining the entire lake. Now, what they did with Duck Lake is that the Forest Service came in and dug 3,719 feet of ditches in 1989. They dug these ditches to be three to four foot deep and 20 feet wide. They used ANFOL, which is ammonium nitrate fertilizer mixed with fuel oil. But however, instead of creating these areas of deep water for waterfowl, they ended up draining the wetland because they went into a loose layer of clay. So now Duck Lake doesn't hold water for more than a couple of days following a heavy rain. And it's interesting, here's the drilling rig that they used to drill the holes for blasting with ammonium nitrate in 1989. And what they did is they took these bags of ammonium nitrate, mixed them with fuel oil, and placed them in each hole and had quite a few explosions. And at the time, they thought they were doing the best thing. And I see this throughout the southern interior of British Columbia, where excavations have been made in the natural wetlands. And those excavations have penetrated the compacted clay layer, and they've drained the natural wetlands. And here's what the site looks like at Duck Lake after it was completed. And you know this project is a failure because there's no water collecting in the ditches. They're all dry. They had the wrong technique. There's no groundwater here. So what they did is they actually fracked the clay and drained the wetland forever. So these ditches were collecting runoff, injecting it into the ground. And now when you look at Duck Lake, there are only a few areas that are growing sedges and it doesn't hold water anymore. So we went in there in 2014 with a project to restore part of Duck Lake. And we went into the deep ditches that hit impermeable layers and we scraped off the topsoil, the vegetation, saved it. And we took this clay and we shaped basins. And then we lined the areas with 70 centimeters of clay that was compacted in layers. And yes, it worked. The wetlands returned and Duck Lake now holds water. So what's a altered wetland look like? Well, here's a wetland in British Columbia near the city of Trail. And uh, this wetland is in a timber harvest area and it's been filled in with logs so they could cross it to cut trees on the other side. And we examined the inlet and the outlet carefully and found erosion and head cuts. So we identified a head cut where the red arrow was located and this head cut was moving upstream and would cause a deepening and widening of a ditch and further drain the wetland area. 
So we planned a restoration project and we were we used these large diameter logs and buried them in the ground at the inlet and outlet of the wetland to control the head cut to stop the erosion and to restore the wetland. And uh, the brown line here shows where we buried the logs to restore the wetland. Okay, maybe you've walked through a swamp or forested wetland. And when you walk through a swamp or forested wetlands, you're gonna find features that tell you whether or not the area was drained or altered. The surface of the ground in a forested wetland is uneven. It contains pits, mounds, and ridges, and trees and shrubs are growing on the higher, well-drained ground. And when you get into a, a swampy area, you're gonna find that when a tree blows over, it leaves a mound or a tip up and then a pit. And if there's a high water table, that pit will contain water seasonally. And natural forested wetlands are difficult to walk through because of the pit and mound topography. So forested wetlands are a complex mixture of shallow water streams, pits, mounds, fallen trees, lots of woody debris. They're truly a mess. The trees that fall over in a forested wetland, uh, this one is 15 feet above the ground. So natural swamp, uneven ground, and they also contain braided streams. And these were the areas that were filled and leveled and drained for farming. So what's a forested wetland look like before it's drained? You're looking at here. It has a natural stream that's flowing through it. The stream is braided. There are many different channels. The banks are less than 15 centimeters high. The depth, it goes in and out of beaver ponds. And there's numerous logs that are embedded across the floodplain. Natural streams and forested wetlands have these braided channels that beaver will often block. So uh, beaver have built a dam across this natural stream in a forested wetland. And notice how the shoreline of the wetland contains bays, points, and peninsulas. And you also see a diversity of mounds and ridges. And all these provide uh, for a diversity of plants. Can you see the ditch in this photo? It's called a diversion ditch built along the base of the hill. This is on Cortez Island, BC. And this ditch was dug to drain a forested wetland. It follows the base of the hill. Look at the field on the right. There's no imperfections, no pits, mounds, or woody debris. This has been farmed for many years. This is what a beaver pond looks like after it's been drained for farming. It's a shallow basin, contains some sedges, reed canary grass. It's bordered by a ditch. The field is no longer being farmed and has grown up to reed canary grass. Now farmers planted this reed canary grass. I collect drainage books and I see many references of farmers planting reed canary grass in the wetland that they recently drained and they cut it for hay. Here's what a drained forested wetland looks like. The wetland was drained for farming in the 1800s. The drainage involved digging the ditch, removing the trees and stumps, leveling the pits and mounds, filling in the wetland basins, and then installing buried drainage structures made out of rock and stone. This abandoned field has since grown up to trees, and many people would think that's a natural stream. Large machines have been used to level the pits and mounds found in many of our natural forest wetlands so they can be farmed. You're looking at an oil and gas well pad that was made by draining and filling a forested wetland in BC. And if you walk outside of the well pad, you'll see where the forested wetlands, beaver ponds were located, are still located. So wetlands are often found in the bays of shallow lakes and even deep lakes that have shallow bays. Unfortunately, the wetlands associated with lakes are not immune from disturbance. Here we see a wetland that's being damaged by dirt bikes. The rubber tires are crushing aquatic plants, frogs, toads, and salamanders, and the ruts are carrying water that cause head cuts to form and erosion. <laughs> 
These two individuals are standing on soil that was placed in a wetland. They built a road on the edge of this lake by, called Violin Lake. Um, the two red lines you see here, that's where soil was pushed into Violin Lake to partially fill the lake. Here's where a road was built along the shores of Violin Lake and they filled in these shallow water wetlands. The natural shoreline contained a diversity of wetland areas. The Boulder Mountain Guest Ranch is located between the Escalante Grand Staircase National Monument and the Boulder Mountain Range uh, near Boulder, Utah. It's a 166 acre ranch and overlooks the Painted Desert. This is a dry area. It's near the Dixie Forest National Forest and it's near a it's arid. There's deep canyons here. You would not expect to find wetland drainage. And when you visit this Boulder Mountain Guest Ranch, you'll find a deep valley where Beaver built a series of ponds along Sweetwater Creek. But when you get up on higher ground, you see hay fields and pasture fields. Well, this hay field used to be wetland. In fact, there were many wetlands on higher ground in the valley. And if you look at an uh, aerial photo of the Boulder Mountain Guest Ranch, if you look closely at this photo, you'll see some straight lines. Those straight lines are either irrigation ditches or drainage ditches. And there I've colored them in so you can see. Now see the green shaded area along the base of the mountain? That's where springs have water emerging from the base of the mountain. And when you go along the base of the mountain, you find springs popping out along the uh, base of the mountain that are should be covering the fields with water because the water from these springs naturally maintains wetlands. However, the flow from these springs doesn't reach the historic wetland areas or adjacent land. And the fields that are near the springs are really dry and they're being heavily grazed by livestock. And people didn't know why. They thought, why are these fields so dry? Well, I did a little bit of exploring and I found that ditches have been dug along the base of the mountain to divert the water from the springs. And then also ditches have been dug through the fields to carry excess water from the springs so the cows would not get stuck in the mud. So the water from the springs most likely supported a system of wetlands that were maintained by beaver before the ditches were dug. And the main reason the wetlands drained so that the livestock wouldn't get stuck in the mud and also to collect water for irrigation and to move this to land that was even drier. And then they wanted to cut the land for hay, so they needed that water for irrigation. And if they diverted it in ditches, they could collect it and then spread it over the land. So here you're looking at a natural wet meadow, one of the few that remains on the ranch. And this is one where the water from the springs was allowed to flow over the landscape in a sheet-like pattern, not in narrow ditches. Now I can I know and found these ditches. They were hard to find. And all that brush was full of thorns and just tore you apart. And this gives you an idea what the ditches look like. And the, how, how I found this ditch, I could hear the water flowing. The water was flowing over head cuts in the ditch and making a noise. The ditch was being carved deeper and wider because of the erosional head cuts in the ditch. This gives you an idea how thick it is. Now, I find that most people that look for places to build wetlands, they go into nice farm fields and they say, I don't know, I wanna make this a wetland. Well, I recommend that you look a bit harder and you look for parts of the wetland that were drained, but not drained completely, like what you're looking at here. This is a great place to restore a wetland, but it's gonna take some work to get through this brush. So this was the only section of the diversion ditch that was visible in an aerial photograph. And uh, so I'm convinced that most signs of wetland drainage go undetected because most people do an office review instead of a field review. And you really must be willing to get your feet wet and muddy to get into these areas and to find the ditches. <laughs>
Maybe you've read this book. Okay, Richard P. Hobson Jr. wrote three books about his forming a partnership with an individual named Panhandle Phillips. This pair traveled from Wyoming to British Columbia in the early 1930s. They formed the Frontier Cattle Company. They established a large ranch north of Anaheim Lake and the Chilcotin, and he formed a partnership that lasted until the end of the 1940s. And then Hobson moved to the Vanderhoof area and they continued ranching. Now, what makes these books special to me is that Rich Hobson describes in detail how he and other ranchers converted massive wetlands into productive hay and pasture land by first removing the beaver dams and then by digging extensive networks of ditches to convert swamps into wet metal wetlands. Just remarkable what happened here. And if you have a chance to read these books, look for those uh, portions that talk about drainage. Um, Robin Anschild is the one who directed me to these books. A landowner showed them to her. Uh, she was restoring wetlands on property and this adjacent landowner said, have you read these books? And it's just amazing to learn how much drainage took place in ranch and range areas. So numerous wetlands can be restored on the Boulder Mountain Guest Ranch. And you hear an irrigation ditch that is really draining the wetland because they're no longer using it for irrigation. And that's what we see so often. Often Ditches that were dug for irrigation like this one, they will drain wetlands when they're no longer carrying water for irrigation. And that's what you see here. This used to be a wet metal wetland in a beaver pond on the wine kept Gamble Ranch in northwestern, northeastern Nevada. Hard to believe this used to be wetland. In fact, the wetland probably looked like this. And these wet metal wetlands were common in northeastern Nevada. The valleys didn't contain streams with bed and banks. However, the Natural Resources Conservation Service had a better idea and they funded projects with these ranchers where they would dig ditches in these wet metals to drain them for improved grazing and for hay production. And here's what we see happening. They dug a ditch for drainage and they triggered a head cut to form. And this head cut is advancing uphill and causing a deepening and widening of a ditch. And it's draining the wetland by eliminating standing water by lowering the elevation of groundwater. And this is across the whole valley. So the red arrow points to the head cut advancing up the valley. This was triggered by the digging of a ditch downstream. And a head cut's like a small waterfall. It forms a deep and a wide channel in a wetland where there historically was no channel. And the head cut deepens the ditch and it moves uphill and unzips the wetland just like a zipper. It lowers the elevation of groundwater. It eliminates standing water. Let's take a look at a few of these now. Here's the head cut as it's moving up through the wet metal. Here's a head cut that's been moving for about five years through a wet metal. You can see that uh, it's starting to get dry on either side of the ditch. Here we have a ditch that has eroded quite deeply. And you can see that there's no longer sedges and rushes growing on either side. And here's a ditch that head cuts have moved through. You can see the roots that are exposed from the adjoining grasses. These roots show you that erosion is taking place. And this erosion is causing a deepening and widening of this artificial channel. And there's really no easy way to repair these. So here's the same site further downstream from the wet metal wetland where you see all, saw the head cut forming. This area used to be wet metal wetland. Historically, there was never a stream channel with a better banks in this area. The stream channels form the head cuts and it's turning the wet meadow into dry ground. How bad can it get? Really bad. This canyon you see, this used to be a wet meadow. The head cuts forming in the ditch turned it into a dry area with rabbit brush and sagebrush. And the canyons get deeper and deeper. The head cuts, there's no end to how deep they can go in this part of Nevada.
And this is how bad the erosion can get. Do you know most erosion is caused because somebody dug a ditch to drain a wetland upstream and head cuts are moving in that ditch, resulting in erosion? So the majority of wet metal wetlands in Canada and the U.S. have been drained by ditches, and then they've been further drained by head cuts moving through the ditches. Here's a prime example of a wetland being drained by head cuts moving up a ditch. Someone dug a shallow ditch along the base of that hill. Head cuts are now moving up and causing a deepening and widening of the ditch. And this is lowering the elevation of groundwater over the entire valley. Sometimes you can see signs of drained wetlands on aerial photographs. Here's a 2020 Google Earth image near Collins, Indiana. And I've labeled some of the drainage features on the photo. That helps to look at old aerial photographs to identify drainage features. This photo is only from 1998, but it shows different drainage features from the more recent photo. Here's a photo. You can see large scale wetland drainage. This photo was taken in June 2020. It's really worth finding old aerial photographs to identify drainage features. So here's an old aerial photograph taken to the same area. You can see the ghosts of drained wetlands, the shadows, the difference between areas and lands, and the harvest pattern from just plain cutting hay. One should always search for old aerial photographs to help you identify where wetlands used to be. The 1929 image on the left was prepared by Norman Allard Jr. with the Lower Kootenai Band. He stitched together four aerial photographs and geo-referenced them. The image on the right was a recent LIDAR completed before we did wetland restoration in the area. The 1929 photo shows historic wetlands and streams that were modified and destroyed by 2019. Both images show ditches that were dug to drain wetlands and to move rivers and streams. So the earliest photos I know of for most of Canada are from the 1930s. Same goes for the US. Unfortunately, <laughs> most wetlands in the US were drained before the 1930s. Tom, can I interrupt yes. you for a moment? Um, we've got about seven minutes left for your presentation time and we have a couple of questions in the chat. If you Okay. Well, you're looking at a LIDAR image here and you can use this to identify drained wetlands. You can see the shallow basins and the ditches. Some of these ditches were dug by hand in the 1700s. And you can look at other features like this pump on the landscape. That shows you where wetland was located. Okay, so to wrap things up, there are many, many features that indicate an area used to be wetland. And here are some of them. We're not gonna go through them, but you know, it's more than just ditches out there. But the good news is we can restore wetlands. Wetlands can be restored in the landscape. And I look forward to Robin's presentation where she talks about some of the techniques that can be used to drain wetlands. Okay, any questions? Um, would you mind going through the uh, queue and letting me know what the questions are? Alana? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we have a couple questions from Liz. So she asked, do farmed wetlands have the same biodiversity as normal wetlands? You know, people think that if you restore wetland, it'll have greater biodiversity than if you create one. I have found that they're the same. In fact, I have found restoring a wetland to be more difficult than creating one because there are so many drainage features you have to disable. So as far as biodiversity goes, I think that it depends on how you restore it and how you create it to get maximum biodiversity. But whether or not you add large woody debris, pits and mounds, shallow water areas, staging areas, it's a good question. Thanks, Tom. Um, Liz also had a question about head cuts. She's, she asked just for further explanation on how do head cuts move up a stream? Okay, how do head cuts move up a stream? Well, you know, that's a good engineering question right now. A head cut is a nick point and it's a small waterfall and shear stresses are high and it causes erosion. And that erosion, there's a lot of turbulence, and that causes a deepening and widening 
of the soil that washes away. And you can actually watch head cuts move. If you ever drained a beaver pond, pulled out a beaver dam, you can watch the head cuts advance through the, the loose sediments. So the Grand Canyon was formed by massive head cuts, to give you an idea how powerful head cuts are. Niagara Falls is actually a head cut that moves upstream about a meter each year. Okay, next question. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, there's no more questions in the queue right now, but I had a question for you and I wanted to ask, you showed an example of how somebody inadvertently drained a wetland using explosives. Can you speak on your to your experience of restoring wetlands using explosives? Okay, under certain conditions, you may want to consider using explosives to build a wetland. And these are locations where you're not able to access with heavy equipment, but yet you want some deeper water and you must have a site where the groundwater is at the surface. However, I've seen wetlands that have been built with explosives that are really ugly. So I recommend using an excavator wherever possible because you can really shape the landscape and disable historic drainage structures. And explosives must be used by somebody who's trained and in a remote area so you don't damage somebody's windows and break their windows. But it's a lot of fun to use them. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, does anybody have any other questions for Tom while well, we still have him for another three minutes? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question or put it in the chat and I can ask for you. You know what I find with wetland restoration? Most people think that if an area doesn't look like a wetland, it's a wetland creation. When really, when an area doesn't look like a wetland, it's probably because somebody's been done a better job draining it. So you have A work draining wetlands and you have D and F work. If the area where you wanna work still looks like a wetland, that was drained by that F student. If it looks like a flat, well-drained farm field, that was drained by the A student. The key is to dig, to look for these drainage structures and to get out there and restore these wetlands is probably the most rewarding thing you can do in your life. One of the most rewarding things. Thanks for the opportunity to talk. Let me know if you have any questions. I congratulate the BC Wildlife Federation for all of their work and letting people know that wetland restoration is possible. I appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. We just have another question in the chat. So Aiden said, what are some challenges when creating or restoring a wetland in a more urban setting? Oh, people are always worried about mosquitoes. They are, they're worried about mosquitoes, but we know that a healthy wetland actually lowers mosquito populations because of all the predators living in the water. People are worried about drowning. They say you can drown in six inches of water. Well, I don't know where that came from. I think it came from people who were on drugs and had been drinking alcohol and they passed out in their bathtub and drowned. Because I've worked with children you know, my grandchildren, I remember when they were six months old, if they tipped over in the tub, they got their head out of water pretty quick. Now, of course, I was watching them closer than you think. But you really, um, urban areas are great places to build wetlands. You'll see a lot of wildlife and people can really experience the wonders, the valleys of wetlands right in their backyard. And the BC Wildlife Federation is helping educators to build wetlands at schools, even in urban areas. So something to consider if you're an educator. I just want to mention that um, some of the, the more of the challenges that we've um, experienced with building some of these urban wetlands is the permitting process. So depending on the environment or the municipality that you're building in, you might need to do additional services in terms of like soil movement, um, depending on their environmental development permits. Um, yeah, so it could just be a little bit more costly or time consuming depending on the permits. Uh, Laura, you have your hand up. Do you want to mute yourself? Um, yep. Hello. Um, thank you very much, Tom. That was really a great Laura. presentation. I, I got a lot from that. Um, I'm just actually wondering if we can be provided with a copy of the list that you had uh, on how to detect a drained wetland. I, you went through it in your presentation, but that would be great to get a copy of. Yes, um, the two books that I've written, Wetland Drainage, Restoration, Repair, and Wetland you know, Restoration and Construction, a Technical Guide, you'll find those lists in the book. 
but I will uh, email them to the uh, BC Wildlife Federation and they can share with them everybody. Be happy to do that. Mm, great, thank you, Tom. If you want to send that my way, then I can share it. Um, I also know a wrap up email for the workshop, so I can I can share that in there. That would be fantastic. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Tom. That was so informative as always. And I have to say, every time I hear you talk about wetland drainage, I just, I'm out there looking at fields, trying to spot like all these things that you've talked about and looking for outlets, ditches, all that stuff. So thank you so much for that. Thank you.